Alrighty, folks, it is 10.01, which I think it means it is officially time for us to get underway. At this point, I'm going to ask all of our panelists to please start up their webcams so that we can see their beautiful faces. They can pop on and we can see some of the experts that are going to be joining us today. And I will kick us off with a couple of brief introductions and housekeeping items before I turn it over to some of our experts to really get this show on the road. So I'll start us off by saying good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Talia. I'm the Virtual Experiences Coordinator at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, which means that my job, um, by and large, is to coordinate and help run a lot of the virtual events that maybe some of you have attended over the last few months. Um, and my role for this program today specifically is to be sharing your questions and your comments with our experts. So uh, if you haven't already done so, take a moment to type in the chat and say hi. Let us know where you're watching from today. Maybe you're enjoying some coffee or some breakfast while you're listening in today, while you're tuning in. Um, let us know if there's anything in particular you're really interested in hearing. If you have an, a particular affiliation with water and energy, you know, what brought you to this webinar today? And uh, one of our sort of icebreaker questions that we, we used to kick things off this morning was, what watershed were you born in or which one do you live in now? So several people have chimed in in the chat to, to tell us that, but if you haven't done so, let us know. Uh, we do have a special security feature enabled which has your chats going only to us, the panelists in the webinar today. So we are seeing your chats. You all are not seeing each other's messages. That's okay. They need to go to us. And my job um, at the end of the program today is going to be to bring your questions and comments to our experts. So keep those coming. I will be watching. We're so excited to hear your questions. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce now Dr. Patty Limerick. She is the director for the Center of the American West Museum with uh, University of Colorado. Is that right, Patty? I'll let you take on more of your introduction. Um, I think I'll skip more of my introduction, but I am <laughs> a builder and that's a great pleasure. But I will, no, I will not skip this part because it's so important that I am so happy to be the moderator that I keep, I'm not in Zoom mode. I'm wearing a uh, full Western wear. Uh, Steve Weil, wherever you are from Rock Mount, Rock Mount shirt, I'm wearing a skirt instead of just slacks. And this is really hard to do, but boots, cowboy boots. I'm wearing cowboy boots. That is how committed I am to being here today. And I will say over since mid-March, that's the first time this whole regalia has been in place, except Tuesday. I did it on Tuesday. And uh, while I'm at the Western Wear thing, I am the timekeeper at these events. And so everyone knows, each speaker knows it's sort of 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, and when the person starts to be coming into the last one or two minutes, I will put on the white hat. Last time I had just a black cat, but I am, I wanted to be clear that I am a good guy. So I am just coming on with this if it's getting close. And then if it goes a little bit too long, the black cat. Okay. So, well, thank heavens for the symbol system of the American West. What a joy to have that. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm going to do a little bit of the background on the project that we're a part of here. This is a uh, program that the members of the Colorado Scientific Society or the leadership of that group wanted to have. So I want to thank Jim. These are uh, present and past presidents. So this is Jim Paces, uh, Tom Casadevall, and most of all, Bob Reynolds, who brought us together for this, for this event. I also want to thank the folks from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, Jessa Phillips and Talia uh, Farnsworth, who is our our coordinator in lots of ways, and Gabby Chabaria, the uh, vice president who has been so helpful on many occasions. I want to thank Kurt Gutjahr, Honey Ashenbrenner, and Lisa Cooper from the Center of the American West, and Shelby Litton, recent CU graduate in geosciences who worked on this highly employable, very employable young woman. So um, anybody looking for a young geoscientist, get in touch. So uh, now I would like to say a few words about what our project here is. Um, we are conducting a four-part series that was supposed, you were supposed to be in each other's company and in our company, but that obviously is not working in the current state of the world. So we are doing this in four sessions. We had one on Tuesday, one on Thursday, and then another two next week on Tuesday and Thursday. The title of the series is Water and Energy in Colorado, Emulsifying Two Great Challenges in Four Parts. And my private uh, personally designed title is What Nature Has Brought Together, Let No One Put Asunder, Assembling the Pieces of the Energy Water Puzzle. And that basically says the same thing as the actual title. So uh, we are bringing energy and water together. And what we did last time on Tuesday is that we had four panelists and we figured it all out. We just got all the problems solved. We just, well, 
That was not altogether true. Uh, but we did get a really good start on these issues and problems. And today we have uh, four new people joining us and it's going to be, uh, I think, a wonderful follow-up on what we did for, as you may recall from last time, the key words are normal, prepared, and resilience. And anyone of the panelists who uses that, it's like a Groucho Marx secret word thing where the duck would come down and so on. Uh, and well, Groucho Marx would have given you $100, but that is not going to happen on this one. So, but feel free to use those words or give us other key words that we should be bringing together. We got going uh, just kind of at the start of a discussion of population growth and conservation at our last session, and we'll want to come back to that. We hit, I think in many ways, an optimal combination of realism and optimism in our remarks. We were always in touch with the central theme of the centrality of science and how we make decisions and navigate through the world that we live in uh, with these particularly intense issues of water and energy in the West. And I would introduce what I did not introduce last time, my extraordinarily insightful phrase that no one will ever adopt consistently, I don't know why, that for the last hundred years or so, we have been living in the era of improbable comfort made possible by a truly astonishing but taken for granted infrastructure. So should be a household phrase, isn't yet. But for water and energy, we have become very understandably complacent. We became complacent and consumers had a really nice run where they could take energy and water supply for granted. That taken for granted part now is winding down and that is really the occasion for our conversations here. So uh, my horoscope, last time you heard my horoscope, uh, this one is, well, this, the one from the Denver, uh, from the Daily Camera was far too ambitious. Um, I'm, today, my instructions for today, make opportunities, build a stable future. Well, that's not workable. <laughs> How, what on earth a stable future might mean now. So yeah, right. But then the one in the Denver Post I thought was really good. This is a wonderful time to separate the promising from the outmoded. I think we could try that today. Okay, so we have our, our four speakers. The first speaker is my long, long time friend, Roger Frawa, who has dedicated his professional career to the advancement and development of American Indian communities. He's currently the president of CODA Holdings. CODA is an organization that focuses on tribal development projects and efforts of energy companies within Indian country. He formerly served as the deputy director of the Council of Energy Resource Tribes and that uh, is where he worked with 47 federally recognized tribes and four Canadian First Nations, and in fact, also where I got to have the privilege of meeting him. He is a member of Hemas Pueblo in New Mexico, where he has served as tribal administrators. And last time we spoke about how we should have agriculture more centrally in the conversation and that we should have someone who represents that profession and that vocation and calling. And so I'm happy to say that Roger is a farmer. So Roger Frawa speaking on Indian country and access to energy and water. Uh, and you're muted and you need to be unmuted. There we go. Excellent. Got it. Patty, good morning. Morning. Um, well, I wanted to say right up front that I'm normally more prepared to be more resilient. Um, and I just wanted to get that out, out there in front um, because I, I would ra I, I'd ra really rather be more prepared. But anyway, here I am. Um, so I wanted to tell you, uh, Patty, that I'm talking to you from the Pueblo of Jemez, which is in the Jemez River watershed. And my goal today is to really to stay in front of the white-hatted moderator because my DNA starts to become very nervous and sweaty for some reason when the black hat goes on. I don't know what it is about that um, part of my DNA, but it just, it's something very internal to me when I see the black hat. So my goal is to stay ahead of that black hat today. Um, but happy to be here. Oh, Patty, please, thank you very much for putting the black hat away. <laughs> um, so my name is Roger Frau. I am from the Pueblo of Jemez. Um, I am a farmer. And I am talking to you from my home today, which is a straw bale house that has three uh, forms of solar energy uh, in that house. And we do run a not-for-profit that looks at non-scientific water conservation, soil restoration strategies, 
uh, in a farmer association uh, program. Um, and if anything, you know, we are, as Pueblo Indians, we really are at the core of just uh, generations, uh, thousand year old farmers uh, plowing the same thousand year old ground using thousand year old seeds. And we try and eke out a living and everything we do is really based on water and agriculture. Um, my energy background is I have learned uh, the energy background at the feet of those tribal leaders uh, over years of, of being at their feet and learning um, very humbly from their wisdom. So um, I try to qualify myself uh, as an energy and water user um, uh, because I've spent my life uh, really trying to use um, energy in a very conservative way and, and using water in a very conservative way. Uh, but I come to you by way of Indian country as a legal definition uh, is 577 plus federally recognized American Indian tribes uh, that are comprised of about two and a half million Indian people. They're growing at a rate of about 4% per year or doubling every 18 years. We have 53 million acres that constitute Indian country geographically spread across 33 states um, in these United States. Um, and we have senior rights on, on, on lots of water. So the presentation I'd like to introduce, uh, Indian Energy and Indian Water, um, we have about 20% of America's fossil fuel resources, uh, oil, gas, coal, other minerals. Um, in India country, we have a unnumerated amount of renewable energy resources, uh, wind, solar, biomass, hydro, um, and, uh, and our lands are playing host to lots of uh, energy uh, resources, electrical and uh, fossil fuel pipelines and transmission lines through right away. Um, Indian energy, when we think about Indian energy, we think about that in a sense of from the raw resources, again, of the, the fossil fuel energy resources and the renewable energy resources, and then the kinds of generation uh, that uh, resides on Indian lands, the transmission, the distribution system, uh, the end use of those, again, uh, going to our uh, 577 tribes and two and a half million American Indian people that are growing at a 4% population rate, we use a lot of energy. Um, but when you start thinking about uh, energy and the evolution of energy, you know, we can go out throughout history and talk about um, the energy resources that were um, uh, are being utilized by the non-Indian world through uh, leases and, and those kinds of arrangements uh, that Indian tribes have had. But I think the evolution of Indian energy is tribes are, are becoming more proactive in the energy sector and uh, taking more political and um, uh, economic uh, control of those energy resources. So we've seen some real significant changes and, in and in advancements uh, for tribes uh, and their energy use. Um, and uh, when you start thinking about energy, at least here in the inner Rocky Mountain West, it's very hard for our minds not to gravitate to the Four Corners. When we think about what's happening in the Four Corners with the, uh, the removal of coal, the depressed oil and gas sectors based on international pricing and uh, domestic uh, development of hydraulic fracturing of, of lots of energy resources across the United States. Um, and then the political perspectives of, of, uh, of the, what's happening in the Four Corners, that that really has created some real challenges uh, to tribal communities and tribal economies. And water, there's no form of energy that doesn't require uh, the use of water. And so I think for the tribes, you know, looking at um, uh, trying to supply our own tribal communities, um, we have a significant portion of the Navajo reservation that walks on top of coal, oil, gas, underneath wind and, and solar and transmission lines and distribution lines. Um, but much of the Navajo reservation, by example, is not even have access to electricity in 2020. So we sit here on a Zoom conference uh, and one of the largest tribes in the country with one of the greatest resources doesn't have access to electricity. So when we start thinking about those kinds of challenges and that dilemma, um, 
it really does create some, some real challenges, but I think it also creates opportunities uh, at the same time. So when we start thinking about that uh, very delicate balance of uh, energy and water um, and the decision-making that's based on social, cultural, economic, and political perspectives, I think that tribes uh, don't have a cultural monopoly, but we do bring a constant cultural um, uh, perspective in our decision-making when we think about the wing, the fin, and the four-legged in some of our decision-making um, as we think about developing water and those energy resources. So sustainability on the front side of water and energy use and not on the back side as an afterthought goes into some of that decision-making. And I think that that dilemma of trying to balance um, cultural preservation, environmental protection, and economic development is really a, a very tough balancing act, I think, for the modern tribal leader. And that's what we try to do is try and help those tribal leaders kind of think through some of those kinds of, of very tough decision making. So um, I think that, you know, when we start thinking about that balance of, of energy and water, I'm here today to try and um, pepper in um, a generic tribal or native perspective. I don't speak for the Pueblo of Jemez. I come from the Pueblo of Jemez. Um, and I think that uh, in, in advance, asking for forgiveness in terms of any communication that may be offensive, it's not my intention to, to be offensive. It really is to try and give more of a generic uh, perspective. And um, so I, I hope that I don't uh, offend anybody. Just kind of in closing to say ahead of that uh, black hat, um, I think that we need more diverse thinking and the scientific community. There's a lot of benefits I think that can be gained from indigenous knowledge. And I think when we start thinking about indigenous knowledge and indigenous thinking, you know, we say we're non-scientific people. I say as my um, introduction that I'm a lay person, but I come from the Chacoan complex from Colorado to Mexico uh, that laid on a GPS uh, line today. It's just amazing. The architecture, the biology, the botanists, the engineering, the architecture, um, all those kinds of scientists. So I think we really need to encourage lots of diverse thinking in science and embrace indigenous knowledge um, and, and seek out um, opportunities where we can have more uh, conferences and Zoom sessions like this where we can invite in more indigenous and native thinking uh, and diverse thinking into the scientific community. Um, and I really challenge the scientific community uh, to reach out to uh, not just to Indian country, but to other minority uh, communities and diverse thinking to really embrace and uh, to bring in that um, diverse thought into science. Um, and I think that we're all going to be better for that. So, um, you know, I just think that if, if we are able to bring that in, I think it's going to be for a much better and brighter future, don't you? Roger, thank you so much. And <laughs> the black cat has an unfortunate affect to it, which is uh, why it landed on the floor there. But but you, <laughs> so that, although it is a rather nice hat, so I don't think it will stay on the floor. I think I will pick it up eventually here. But I do want to quote one of our, our people in the chat, uh, James McCauley, who said, Roger is, in fact, exquisitely prepared. So I think he speaks for all of us in saying that was an modest but um, underestimation of what you have done for us here. And I, I want to say on behalf of the, the Colorado Scientific Society that the current president, who's one of our planning members, actually um, sent me a message fairly recently saying that, that everything that has happened in the nation in terms of a better reckoning with diversity is something that has to be in our discussions here. And so thank you so much for reminding us of how, how significant Indian people are in this story. Happy to say New York Times Today has a story on the uh, of uh, the Apache folks in Arizona who apparently are just leading in contact tracing and just way ahead of, of other groups and that. So there's one place just to say that is pretty darn relevant and something we should be paying attention to. So thank you as always. So uh, 
Jordan Smith was, uh, the journalist was going to be with us, but that didn't work out. And so we have had a, a very, very excellent replacement join us. Jayla Poppington is the executive director of Water Education Colorado. She previously oversaw uh, print and digital content programming and served nine years as the editor for Headwaters Magazine, Water Education Colorado's flagship publication. This is really a great, great organization for taking scientific knowledge and making it accessible and clear and lively in expression and showing how much human communities rely on and uh, need to benefit and take advantage of what scientists are doing, sometimes a little less intelligibly and clearly in their communications. Not to say anything against scientists, but, but uh, Jayla has had a very, very fine effect on communicating important science and policy issues through this human interest lens. She came from Chicago, for heaven's sake, what a, well, she's just powered on with so much spirit despite that original start. And she came to uh, Colorado to go to CSU for college. She fell in love with Colorado's rivers while guiding commercial rafts down the Cache Laputa River. So ladies and gentlemen, here is Jayla Poppleton Pop uh, speaking on mounting pressures on food producers in a headwater state. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patty and Talia and Bob for inviting me to be here today. I'm really pleased that I get to join this group of panelists to speak with you about connections between water and energy and uh, it really struck me that you had mentioned, Patty, in your opening remarks that we rely on this tremendous infrastructure in Colorado to um, deliver our water and produce our energy. And to hear Roger talk about the tribal um, just lack of power connection and something that I'm sure many people read in the news about the Navajo Nation um, and the high rates of COVID-19 that were partly a result of a lack of running water um, it's just really a, a tragedy um, in this day and age. And I wish I had it in front of me, but um, as Patty mentioned, one of the programs of Water Education Colorado that we use to inform community members about a wide variety of water issues is our Headwaters Magazine. And I grabbed a couple copies that are relevant to my talk today, which is focused on water for food production. Um, this is an issue from 2012, um, looking at Colorado agriculture. Um, back when I was the editor of this magazine. So, um, but, but most recently we focused a, an issue on environmental justice and water. And one of the things that we looked at is the lack of water infrastructure that still exists in some of our communities. Of course, it's not my focus. So I'm gonna move on before um, I get too close to the black hat. Um, but I, I am really pleased to be here. And I wanna um, share the caveat that um, compared to Roger's tremendous um, history and background in agriculture, agriculture is not my background, I come to you today as a, communi a communicator and an educator doing my best to relay the experiences of agricultural um, producers in our community um, as we have reported on those issues through our programs. Um, one of the things that we do is we also bring people, legislators, water managers, and others out into the field to learn about water management close up. And we have visited with a number of ag producers um, in that context as well. So that's um, where I come from today. Um, just to share a little bit about my background. And I'm going to share my screen now because um, I do have a few slides to put up. Again, if I can figure this out. So sorry. No worries, Jayla. As we said, it's, it's just like when at an in-person speaker event, someone's got to make their way up to the podium. And we tested this out and it's still, here we go. I bet everyone would like to hear a limerick or two if that's, or are you there? You got <laughs> Thank it. Thank you, Patty. That would be great. Oh, would you like me to do a limerick? Okay, well, I'd be delighted to do a limerick. So we did do a project on oil and gas development with the Senate of the American West. Uh, and signal me when you've got your slides and I will shut up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, I tried really hard. I had a long series called Fracking Sense, trying to get a temperate, calm perspective on what, hydraulic fracturing meant in practice into communities. And so this was the limerick I wrote um, on my experience there. Um, okay, and remember there's questions about jurisdiction on which state level or county level or whatever should be in charge of issues on fracking. So uh, knowledge is tragically lacking on the complicated subject of fracking. Convinced they are right, people rush out to fight and no agency regulates yakking. So that was the that was our what, one limerick, and then another one. Since apparently I have a little bit more time here, um, since I had claimed neutrality on that subject, okay, uh, 
When you claim to be neutral on fracking, you're a quarterback set up for sacking. You may assert and declare that you're going to be fair, but you still won't escape frequent whacking. Alrighty, so we're still looking for the slides here. Patty, so, do you just make these up on the spot or how does this happen? I certainly do not. I make them up. Uh, I'm a very remarkable creative artist in this one tiny domain. <laughs> it's the only domain in which I am an uh, accomplished creative artist. And they usually arise from agony. The anguish and agony wrote those two limericks with me, basically, because that is a very difficult subject and it's quite disturbing uh, to be seen. Well, you're a quarterback set up for Saki. So I would say my best limericks come from anguish and agony but that occurs off stage, And so they are stored in my mind and they are available for just these kind of pinches when we are uh, all here on the screen and the audience is, they're, well, the audience seems to be keeping good temper here. So I'll uh, so we'll talk <laughs> a little bit on that, but, but I do have a whole bunch of limericks and perhaps you'd like I, to hear. I'm me. so sorry, if you, um, if you want me to continue, I just, I cannot figure this out right now. I can't find the Zoom controls so my computer is being funny. So I can just continue without the slides. If you like, if you feel comfortable doing that. I think that's okay. Yeah. Thanks for hanging in there with us, Jayla. And I think our audience certainly understands technology. No problem. <laughs> All right. Um, well, Bob wanted to, it wanted it to be more of a conversation anyway, so we'll just go with that. Um, so I wanted to start out. I have this slide um, to show you the tremendous um, variety of agricultural products that we produce here in Colorado, because I think you can't start a conversation about agriculture without talking about food. Um, otherwise, it's just rather esoteric. Um, and really, food is the ultimate source of our energy as human beings. So um, Colorado um, has this wonderful heritage of producing um, all of this food. We're a top producer of lettuce, potatoes, onions, wheat, barley, dry beans, cattle, and sheep. And then, of course, this time of year, um, we're all enjoying our Rocky Ford and cantaloupe and our Olave sweet corn and um, we've got the Palisade peaches, which I know um, were, were affected by the late frost this year, and there aren't as many on the market, but I think it's really um, valuable to think about where our food comes from, and we want to be eating local. So um, all of this production results in what is now Colorado's, one of Colorado's top three economic sectors, resulting in $47 billion in production annually and about 200,000 jobs. And then there are all the ancillary benefits of agriculture, such as open space and wildlife habitat and these vistas that even in our tourist economies we rely on. So those are all important things to consider about the value that agriculture brings to our state. And then, um, you know, as, as with everything, agriculture has been impacted by COVID-19. So most, um, most significantly with interruptions in the supply chain, we saw in the news um, closures of some of our meat packing plants early on. Some of our farmers markets didn't open up and then restaurant closures had a tremendous impact on um, just shrinking that market overnight. Um, I'm fortunate to have a relationship with Colorado's Ag Commissioner Kate Greenberg and I got to have a conversation with her in preparation for this talk earlier this week. And um, one of the things that she mentioned was that we were really lucky that COVID hit when it did during the planting season rather than later in the harvest. Um, and so another benefit is that our producers responded. They were resilient um, in building more direct to consumer markets um, and that are taking advantage of a growing appreciation of local food. And so one of the things that she's hopeful of is that that will really stick around even beyond this short term period of time. Um, my next slide was going to focus on the drought and um, there's a headline in the Denver Post last week, an article that was written by Bruce Finley who was actually a panelist in last, last week's or Tuesday's talk um, that Colorado for the first time since 2012, the entire state is designated in some form of drought. A quick sip of water there. Um, it's hot, it's windy, it's dry. The monsoons have come and gone and some of our producers are expecting to have their water shut off any day. So we were fortunate that um, you know 2018 was also a drought year that we had one year in between to fill our reservoirs and we really rely on that storage in these kinds of times. And um, what becomes more problematic is when you see a back-to-back -back drought period um, where we really can't catch up and we can't store that water for use in the next season. Some of the um, ways that producers are responding to the acute drought that we're in right now is um, selling cattle early or keeping their cattle on the range for longer periods of time because they can't find the food or the forage um, necessary to feed them. 
And then um, another thing Commissioner Greenberg told me is that some of our dry land farmers who farm without irrigation uh, actually just didn't even bother planting when they saw that even the weeds weren't coming up earlier in the season. And then all of these impacts are compounded by wildfires that are also fueled by these hot and dry and windy conditions. So I mentioned that we can weather droughts um, as a community, as a state in different sectors when they don't hit us back to back. Um, but one thing that climate scientists are beginning to sound the alarm on is that we're seeing um, not just necessarily these one off droughts, but actually a broader wholesale change toward um, experiencing aridification in our state and in the West. The Western Water Assessment is a group here in Colorado that reports on the science of forecasting and hydrology and they've reported a warming trend regionally in Western Colorado and the broader Colorado River Basin of about two degrees Fahrenheit just since 1980. And so that's resulting in lower stream falls and reduced snowpack and earlier runoff and all of those things impact the ag sector. Um, so here's another connection that I want to raise is what is our role and responsibility as consumers when it comes to um, addressing climate change and looking at how we can change our practices around energy production and consumption to slow or even reverse the impacts of climate change that have these dramatic effects on our water resources. My talk is titled, um, the, it's about the impacts on producers and the mounting pressures they face um, in the context of being in a headwater state. And I had this great map that I wanted to show you, um, but I'll describe it instead. But we really um, serve as the water tower of the West. Our high mountains and our snowpack flows beyond our state's borders to provide water, not only for Colorado, but for 18 other states and the nation of Mexico. So um, we have agreements in place in every direction, uh, all of those borders that govern how much water we must allow to cross the state line to make sure it reaches those downstream users. And um, so this is a constraint, just an existing ongoing constraint, not only for the ag sector, but for all of water use in Colorado, approximately two thirds of our runoff must be allowed to cross the state line. And you've probably seen a lot about, especially the Colorado River Basin in the news um, this is a place where the state as a whole and ag producers are very key and central to the conversation um, is working to improve its preparedness and its resilience to um, ensure that we can continue to meet the terms of the Colorado River Compact, um, which affects our entire, um, our entire state and our water supply. Uh, another uh, ongoing pressure on our ag producers is urbanization and population growth. And you're going to hear from the state demographer next week, so I won't get into any specifics around how the state's growing, but suffice it to say that it is continuing to grow. Uh, people want to live here and it's creating a demand for water resources when you have rivers that are already fully tapped and you have um, uh, really no other great alternatives. Um, you have municipal water providers looking to shore up supplies for their growing communities and they're looking to agriculture. So agriculture really feels like they have a target on their back and um, an individual producer faced with really slim margins um, you know, when their biggest asset, their most valuable asset is their water, uh, the temptation to self, um, it's, it's a very lucrative proposition. And so it has affected agricultural economies that can affect um, others on a, a shared ditch system um, or in the community. And uh, one, one thing that Commissioner Greenberg mentioned as well was that the, the forces that are at play here are really larger than any one producer to really be able to stand up against on their own. So we really need markets and policy to support our agriculture, um, our ranchers and our farmers in keeping that water on the land and avoiding wholesale buy and drive. Um, the state has come up with a few mechanisms that are um, a, an answer and response to that dynamic. And one of them is um, something they call ATMs for short, which is an alternative transfer method. And it enables a, a sort of water sharing on a temporary basis between two different water users, a temporary change in water use on a water right. And um, ag producers do not uh, favor the term water sharing agreement because they, they say it implies that um, just out of the goodness of their heart, they're going to share this water with a growing community in need or with another user. Um, whereas water leasing is the preferred term where a producer is compensated adequately for the use of that water right in a temporary arrangement. And it's important that it be temporary um, because of that protection on the rural ag economies. So the state has um, 
created some limitations such as uh, the number of years out of a 10 year period that you can engage in that kind of a transaction so that the majority of the time the water is still going to the land to the, the production of that agriculture. Um, those kinds of alternative transfer methods are now also being used in the context of protecting water for stream flows um, for environmental benefits. And so that's a, another option for producers in a drought year who are looking to earn some revenue off of that asset. Um, it also allows them to fallow or rest their ground for a period of time. Um, but resolving the issue of ownership, whether it's the producer who maintains ownership and leases that water out to perhaps a municipality, um, that's really an important consideration because if the municipality becomes the owner and is temporarily leasing that water back to a producer until the day that they need it, it's really just forestalling that inevitability of buy and try. I wanted to talk a little bit about efficiency and Patty, I can't actually see you right now <laughs> to see if the black hat or the white hat have come on. So please feel free to interrupt if I'm going too long. Um, efficiency is another option for ag producers to stretch limited water supplies and it's really become a necessity in water short systems where we have aquifer de declining aquifers or other dynamics that um, we really need to stretch those supplies. So a sprinkler irrigation system is a good option for some producers but not for all. I can increase efficiency, I can see you, thank you. Um, it can increase efficiency up to 85% up from 50% for flood irrigation and um, it also allows um, some really interesting applications um, involved with precision agriculture. I think this is fascinating, just the science behind these high-tech um, irrigators who can program their sprinklers to apply their inputs, whether it's water, fertilizers, and other things based on sensors that are in the ground, giving the crop exactly what it needs in different parts of the field um, without overwatering, over-fertilizing, et cetera. Soil health is an initiative that's also launched by the Department of Agriculture, where producers are changing their tilling patterns, they're leaving more crop cover on the land, they're really focused on um, maintaining the biome that can help um, increase soil moisture retention. Uh, so that's something that's um, really taking off and that producers are, have as an option to increase resilience. And, uh, and I'm going to leave it there, but I think all of this leads to this broader discussion around um, what do we value? Why are people moving here? I would argue it's because of our quality of life. And I think we all as consumers, as citizens, um, as community members face the question of what are these decisions that we get to make to protect that quality of life? Um, we can influence policy, we can make different choices, we can be involved um, in conservation and stewardship of the resources ourselves. And part of it's learning and sharing information um, and then being committed to being engaged. And that's uh, really our mission at Water Education Colorado is providing the resources to equip um, community members to do so. So we encourage you to check out um, the resources that we have available. And so uh, I'll turn it back to Patty. Thank you so much. And sorry for the technical difficulties. Oh, that's, those are, I think you were, uh, were resilient in your, <laughs> is powering on, because that can be a very disheartening, oh no, where are those slides? So thank you so much for powering on on that. And, for really making it impossible to say, oh, those ag people out there distant, we don't have a cup of tie to them. So I really appreciate everything you did on that count. I want to say on the issue of energy that I certainly have learned a lot about royalty owners, uh, farmers who are kept in business because they have, they have subsurface mineral mm -hmm. rights of revenue. So that's a very interesting aspect of this whole energy water aspect. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so we might return to that later on or maybe not. Uh, I do have a limerick about, um, no, okay, about suburbs. And I'm going to say, as we make the transition to our suburban speaker here, this is, a, this, is a, this is not my point of view. As a limerick writer, I sometimes just try to capture other people's attitudes and convey them in an efficient form. So uh, we have the mayor of Thornton coming up and she will not take offense at this limerick. That's just really important. So, okay, uh, throughout the American West, the suburbs have made us all stressed. They have eaten up farms, set off fiscal alarms, and given the cities no rest. Now, that is not my personal point of view, but my personal point of view is that too often we are talking about rural and urban issues and relationships, and we leave the suburbs out of that. So that is why I'm so particularly glad that we have today uh, Mayor Jan Coleman, who is the mayor of Thornton, Colorado. She is also, this can't be a walk in the park here, the vice chair of the Rocky Flat Stewardship Council, which 
I'm sure involves a fair amount of adrenaline being the vice chair of, of that, uh, that important group and also a member of the North I-25 coalition. She is professionally herself a licensed professional engineer having received a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Louisiana State University. And then with this wonderful twist, I don't run into this very often. So she's got a degree in electrical engineering and a minor in music performance. And I hope that is the trend for the future for both musicians and engineers that that gets brought together. She has uh, worked in the utility and oil and gas industries in both Texas and Colorado and been a force in that uh, line of work and discussing operations that are conducted safely and with strict environmental protection. So now we have Mayor Jan Coleman speaking on where the need for water and communities and businesses meet. Mayor Coleman. Thank you so much, Patty. Appreciate that great introduction. Uh, and I think some might say as an electrical engineer, talking about water might be a little bit of a stretch, but um, I really enjoy the opportunity. So I'm going to share my screen before we get started. And I think that works. If it doesn't, someone just interrupt me. I do want to recognize that it's difficult to follow Roger and Jayla, who did such a great job with outslides. And the engineer me just really likes the structure that goes behind slides. And so I tend to use them a little bit more. Uh, so today I wanna to talk a little bit about where the need for water in the community and business meets. Fair warning though, I was told to keep these pictures in the presentation more than bullet points to keep everyone online more interested. And so you're now all going to be subject to my vacation pictures of hiking areas. And these are places I've visited with my family over the last few weeks, but don't worry, most of them are fit pretty well because we're always hiking to water. And I have a couple of terrible water puns that you can all groan over as well, but since I can't hear you, it won't bother me too much. When I first joined the Thornton City Council in 2013 as a council member, I had no idea how complicated water use and water rights really were for Colorado. And as I was running for mayor in 2019, I realized that not only was I unaware, but most people don't even think about where our water comes from, how much energy it takes to get that water, or if there could even be a chance that we don't have an unlimited supply which leads us to today's topics. And I wanted to start with a fun map to show how many sources of water we actually have in Colorado, but also to show how much of the water we use comes from areas where only a small part of our population actually lives. And even though the map isn't drawn to scale, you can see that much of the water sourcing in the Denver metro area comes from the Cache the Poudre and the South Platte Rivers. In Thornton, most of our water supply comes from snowpack, snowpack in the Rocky Mountains that melts into the South Platte River Basin, which then flows into the Clear Creek and the South Platte River, which takes me to the next slide. Across our state, we only get an average of 16 inches of rainfall. And as a municipality, we have to continuously evaluate how much water we have available to our community and to constantly watch for drought conditions that can impact our access to water. Water use restrictions are a normal reality for our community. Add to the low precipitation the fact that 80% of the population of our state lives on the Front Range, but 80% of the water falls on the Western Slope, and you get a challenge for ensuring equitable access to this resource. And not only access, but also affordability. Colorado's Constitution recognizes water as a huge impact to population sustainability and economic growth. And Thornton itself is the sixth largest city in Colorado. Our population is about 142,000. And our planned full build out will be around 250,000. That kind of growth demands cheap access to water. Water rights are based on seniority and those who put the water to beneficial use first have the priority to use it before continuing down the priority list. And while this is pretty simple in thought, it continued to be such a complicated issue that an entire court system was created to actively manage usage rights. What continues to be an interesting fact is how we use our water. Most of the use goes towards agriculture, while the next heaviest use is direct to municipalities. Most of Colorado's agriculture industry requires irrigation to grow with grains and feed crops making up the majority of our production. But you can see the huge difference from agriculture to municipalities and then to recreation, commercial, and other uses. While the overall usage of water in Colorado for businesses and industries is just under 2% of total use, it's actually a significant portion of municipal use. 
In fact, up to 36% of municipal water is dedicated to commercial or industrial. And within city, cities, it's used for cooling, heating, indoor plumbing, landscape irrigation, processing, and a few miscellaneous uses. And the energy required to use that water is significant as well. And finally, the last 2% is used directly by the environment. Our vast forests and rangeland use water to survive. Groundwater and aquifers replenish naturally during rainstorms or are supplemented by man-made diversions. I wanna drill down a little bit more into municipal use. As populations continue to grow, water demand has had to keep up with these uses. Half of water used by municipalities is currently used for irrigation of lawns. And that Kentucky bluegrass that is beautiful is a difficult one. And there's a reason that it's not native to Colorado. It's very thirsty. Several communities, Thornton included, are moving away from the traditional manicured lawns towards xeriscape options to help with our conservation efforts. A few more things to consider about that use is that all water utilities are unique. Each city or county has identified the amount of water that they need for their communities and has developed a water system to provide that resource to the community. Municipalities have also placed rules in their systems on where they can purchase water or who they can sell it to. And this was done as a measure of protection so that communities could feel confident that their water supply couldn't be sold to the highest bidder and leave the residents dry. Here's one of those pens I mentioned. And to tie it all back to the first slide, where you source your water depends mostly on where you use it. It can be extremely expensive to construct new pipelines or other infrastructure to bring water from far away. And the energy required to fuel pumps to keep that water flowing only adds to the increase in expense. That expense in turn is then passed on to the consumer. With a goal of keeping costs down, most municipalities would rather trade for water rights closer to home than spend the high capital dollars to move the water large distances. Also knowing that we also have a commitment to keep water for our community members. So we'll have to do whatever is necessary to make it happen. In addition, cities maintain infrastructure to treat, move, store, and reuse water. Thornton relies on a few natural storage areas like the Stanley Lake, but we also have a few man-made reservoirs that we so creatively named our gravel pits. To get the water to our city, we use outside ditches and canals, but we also have to use pipelines to bring the water in from the rivers to our treatment plants. To ensure the quality is acceptable for our use, the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act provide regulation requirements from the federal government. Because Colorado water is so different from other states, we are constantly working with our federal delegation to ensure that these acts don't contradict each other too much. And for example, the Clean Water Act requires a level of treatment for those that discharge into rivers, but it doesn't always match the community need for safe drinking water, which gives us the confidence that the water that comes out of the tap is to a safe standard. What isn't normally talked about is the amount of energy that is required to maintain this infrastructure. We all expect that when we turn the tap on, the water comes out. But in the background is a huge system that enables that confidence level. It takes a huge amount of energy to pump water, treat water, manage it, and then pump water out to the homes and businesses. And finally, as we move towards future planning, I think consumers are becoming much more aware of how we use water. Thornton has a strategy in place to help our community be more efficient in water use, as well as get more creative in our conservation techniques. Our parks are irrigated with non-potable water delivered by ditches into ponds, so we don't have to use chemicals or energy to treat it. And our residents have embraced conservation, extending our need for additional water sources out several years from the original plan. We keep our community informed of drought status and we provide tips and tricks to businesses and community members on how to manage indoor and outdoor use in a way that targets preservation of this very important resource. Over the long term, cities must adjust to meet usage needs but to also become more flexible as the world around us changes. The pandemic is a great example of this. And as more people stayed home, water use in homes has changed as well. And we found out that our water treatment facilities were not necessarily designed for constant use all day long. So we had to make some small adjustments to those facilities to accommodate those new use patterns. So I'll wrap it up with our final slide. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk a little bit about water in Thornton today. I've included a few resources of where my information has come from because I know some people like me like to dig a little bit deeper. And I've only skimmed the surface on water use, but I know that my colleagues today will provide additional insight and I'm gonna turn the camera back over. Thank you. So that was a
hat deprivation experience there. There wasn't any another minute or two and I might have gotten to deploy that. So thank you so much. That was really a, a efficient and I guess that would be what we'd expect from an engineer. So thank you so much for that. It was really a great overview. Now I would like to set the framework here with one more limerick. This seems to be a popular feature here. So this one is called uh, climate change and the stressful life of water managers. As the world proceeds to get hotter, the power to predict will soon totter. The baseline has been battered, the norm has been shattered, but everyone still wants their water. So that seemed like a good limerick for introducing our next speaker, who is Luke Runyon. He is a reporter who covers the Colorado River Basin for public radio station KUNC in Greeley. He investigates how water issues can both unite and divide communities throughout the Western US. He produces feature stories for KUNC and for a, a big network of public media stations. As everybody who was here on Tuesday knows, we think it is incredibly important to include in our operations a uh, really highly skilled journalists because the communication between the policy and science people, um, the journalists are just the essential transmission lines, if I might use that. I don't know if you're a pipeline or a transmission line, but you can decide that, that for yourself. So this is really important uh, to have you here with us. He's, he's covered agriculture before he, he did agriculture and food, before he did the water issue, and he was at Aspen Public Radio uh, for a number of years, which I think is where I first met him. So go back there. And the title is Uniting and Dividing How Water Can Bring Western Communities Together or Drive Them Apart. So Luke Renyon. Thank you so much, Patty, and uh, thank you to the museum and the Colorado Scientific Society, um, all of you out in Cyberland who are uh, taking time out of your day to join us for this conversation. And I love that the this talk series has emulsification in the title, which is such a great word and such an evocative sort of concept. Um, I like to say in my reporting that I try to demystify water in the West. So we have emulsification, we have demystification, and I think that that is kind of the right combo for understanding something that's really complicated like water and energy can be. Um, so like Patty said, my name is Luke Runyon. I cover water for KUNC. My talk is um, about uniting and dividing how water can bring Western communities together or drive them apart. Um, and this is something that's been a theme that's come out of my reporting, covering agriculture for five years and now covering water for uh, almost three years. And I don't think that I'm gonna be blowing anyone's mind uh, by telling you that conflict among water users is nothing new in the West. Um, but for as many stories as there are about people coming to blows over water, sometimes literally coming to blows, um, there are just as many stories about strange bedfellows working together on interesting solutions and forming unique uh, coalitions. Um, stories and narratives about conflict generally get a lot of clicks. Uh, they stir up drama and controversy. And I wanted to just bring a few examples that I've come across in my reporting where scarcity is, is driving collaboration in water as people are trying to figure out how to live with less, um, which is something that all of us in Western communities are gonna have to figure out how to do because of climate change, like Patty just said. Um, so why did I wanna talk about collaboration? Well, I've sort of grown weary of the conflict narrative and um, it's just more surprising than the conflict frame. And I think we all wanna be that person who can add a bit of nuance to a conversation. So the next time that you're at a cocktail party, which might be uh, you know, a while from now, <laughs> um, and inevitably water comes up in the conversation and someone tries to drop that Mark Twain, that supposed Mark Twain quote, um, which I won't say here, we heard uh, before the, the session started. You can actually say, you know what? Actually scarcity can drive some interesting solutions that don't cause us to resort to violence or litigation. Um, and you can be that person who's, who's able to throw in that nuance to the conversation. Um, but also I, I like talking about collaboration instead of division because we get so much division in pretty much everything else that we consume media wise these days. Uh, and water issues don't tend to fall into our traditional partisan traps, which is a good thing. 
Um, it's not really something that politicians run on. Uh, water scarcity and what to do about it is not necessarily a campaign issue. It might, it maybe should be, and that's a whole different discussion. Um, and so you can find people who haven't been driven apart by water issues. And that's not to say that water is apolitical because it definitely is not. Uh, it's just maybe easier to find some of that common ground uh, than in lots of other places in our society. Um, so I brought three examples of where I've seen sort of the most interesting collaboration going on in water. Um, one of those examples is, so the first is from Craig, Colorado. Um, if you're unfamiliar, Craig is in the northwest corner of the state, west of Steamboat Springs. And for a few generations now, it's been a hub of coal production, not just in Colorado, but in the West. You have active coal mines there. You have one of the larger coal-fired power plants there. It's called Craig Station, run by the Tri-State Generation and Transmission. And like many other coal plants in the West, Craig Station, uh, just this year, got a firm date for its closure, which is a phenomenon that we've seen across the West, uh, coal-fired coal power plants closing. Um, and when this closure was announced, I think a lot of reporters, rightfully so, were focused on the loss of jobs and the economic upheaval that this kind of closure would have on a community like Craig. But being the water reporter, my mind immediately went to, what is going to happen to the water that this plant uses? Because a coal-fired power plant uses a lot of water. And I won't go into all the details of how uh, a coal-fired power plant works, but uh, you basically turn water into steam, and that steam turns an engine um, uh, or turbine. And the reason why I wanted to know the answer of what's going to happen to the water, because it's pretty rare that a whole bunch of water in the West gets freed up all at once. And because it, it says something about a community's future, where that freed up water ends up going, whether that's through an agricultural ditch or through a whitewater park or through municipal taps or through a pipe to the front range, that says something about you know, a community's present and future. And so I went up to Craig earlier this year to talk to people in town about what they wanted to see uh, happen to that water that gets freed up. And the closure is still years away. So this is really a time where people can use their imaginations to think about what they want to see uh, happen to that water when the closure actually does happen. Um, and I heard from local elected officials who have strong ties to rural parts of uh, Moffat County who want to see it be used for agriculture. If coal is going to be on the wane, maybe move some of that water to agriculture. Um, I talked with the head of the Craig Chamber of Commerce who sees the community's future as a tourism hub and is pushing for uh, the nearby Dinosaur National Monument to be made a national park in order to draw more people to that area and, and kind of diversify some of the economic base. Um, and she would maybe want to see that freed up water be dedicated to this new national park for river flows in the Yampa River, which is where Craig Station draws its water from. Um, and I also talked to people at local environmental groups who would maybe want to see this water uh, included in the state's in-stream flow program to keep it in the river. And really the conversation in Craig, it does feel like there's an urgency behind it. Um, because this coal plant closing brings up a lot of existential issues within the community. There are big questions at play that don't have clear answers, like what were we in the past? What will we become in the future? And they're grappling with that right now because this big economic engine, a literal engine, is going away in the community. Um, so. That's one case study of people kind of thinking outside the box of, uh, you know, what, what might we do with this, this new resource. The second case study that I wanted to bring up is <clears throat> the Ten Tribes Partnership, um, which is an organization that exists within the Colorado River watershed. And this is something that we've seen a lot of in the last few years is a, a sort of coalescing 
around water by tribal entities um, in the Colorado River Basin. This is something that's been going on the last few years. There's a big conference in Las Vegas every year where people from throughout the Colorado River Basin, different stakeholders come together and negotiate new agreements and make deals and shake hands in hallways um, or, you know, kind of form interesting alliances or trash talk another user. Um, and I've been going to this meeting for the last few years and uh, increasingly the tribal voice at this meetup has been growing stronger and louder. Um, there are more than two dozen tribal entities in the Colorado River watershed, but 10 of those tribes hold the majority of the water rights. Those 10 tribes formed a group more than 20 years ago called the 10 Tribes Partnership. Uh, a guy named Daryl V. Hill, he's a member of the Hickory Apache Nation and he's the chair of the partnership. And I've heard him say a lot that people like to say, oh, well, of course tribes are working on water issues. You know, everyone's kind of working on it. But he makes the point that tr each tribe is very different. And if you know one tribe, you know one tribe. Um, and it's very hard to generalize among the tribal nations in the Colorado River Basin. They vary in their priorities, what their values are, what their economies are, uh, what their geography is. And so just being able to bring together a group of 10 tribal communities around a single issue is a feat in and of itself. And the tribes that make up this group have sizable rights to water. If you add them all up, those 10 tribes have rights to about 20% of all the available water in the Colorado River. Um, and they generally have some of the most senior rights in the West, which makes them even more valuable. But tribes aren't able to use all of the water that they have rights to right now because historically they've been left out or in some cases forced out of negotiations over water management. And so many tribes don't have the existing infrastructure or the means um, to build out that infrastructure to actually use the water that they have rights to. Um, many tribes in the West are also dealing with energy transitions. Um, late last year, you had the closure of the Navajo Generating Station, another coal-fired power plant um, that closed last year. There's proposals to build hydropower projects along the Little Colorado River in the Grand Canyon, which has plenty of tribal opposition. Um, but the reason I wanted to bring this up is that tribes are demanding a seat at the table. Thank you, Patty, for the hat reminder. Um, are demanding a seat at the table in current and future water negotiations. And I think it's one of the most undercovered stories in the West right now that just within the last couple of years, you had tribes in Arizona, the Gila River Indian community and the Colorado River Indian tribes become really integral players in a multi-state deal that um, forced people to make hard decisions about water scarcity in the basin. Um, and th those were called the drought contingency plans. And I've talked to quite a few people who say that that deal may have never come together without the participation of, of tribes. And at the last big Colorado River conference and that one in Vegas last December, there was a strong call to have tribes at the table for negotiating a, a big new agreement that's supposed to start getting underway here at the end of the year. Um, so really, I mean, the reason why I wanted to bring these examples is that they, um, they make me feel hopeful about the future of water in the West because they show that people can, um, can come together and, and find common ground and work together, even if they are very different. So thank you. Well, thank you, Luke. And uh, the horror of my putting the black hat on, just as you're saying, so these make me feel hopeful. <laughs> That was a, that was something that we'll make, I'll make that up to you. I swear to you, I'll make that up to you <laughs> for future occasions. So uh, what a uh, fine talk and really wonderful case studies. Did you, we missed one case study? Was there a third case study or did I? Yeah, I think I just, I, yeah, I didn't have enough time. Can you give it to us in six words? What was your third case study? The U.S. and Mexico are finding ways to work together to try and save the Colorado River Delta. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. That's those were that what efficiency. Good lord, that could almost have been a limerick. It was so efficient. So, okay. So now uh, we are very eager to have at least a couple of minutes 
for the panelists to say anything that they want to say to each other, because in truth, what we have had today is what we don't have in life that often, which is representation, respect for voices of, uh, well, cities, we certainly had that on Tuesday, but, but suburbs and cities, that whole set of relations, we've got that, we've got farms of different scales. We have uh, the, all the interesting questions about how efficiency is working in farms and working in conservation is working in suburbs. So we've got all that in play. Usually those things are fragmented and we have done a lot to, it's been a very fine thing to have those things brought together. So I appreciate that. And that's one main reason why we might all want to chat with each other. And we may have, well, with Craig, we certainly have energy front and center uh, with the comments from the mayor about what the energy it takes to move water around. We certainly have, have that, but we might want to be in a little bit more uh, on the energy water connection. And I will just jump ahead and say what uh, one of our panelists certainly knows very well, that the relationship between Roger Frawa's uh, enterprises and Daryl Dar B. Hills are very close. Those are two folks who work together. So we have that embodied in the panel we have represented. So I think I'm going to propose that we go to Talia, who will get us questions from the audience, but maybe at some point Talia will bring us back just for two or three minutes of exchange among the panelists who might well want to say, here is the coalition that was born today. Maybe not, <laughs> but it's a possibility. So, okay, Talia, you're on. Absolutely. Well, thank you everybody for listening in. Um, a big, I guess, virtual round of applause for our panelists who brought us these great presentations and talks. I think everybody did a stellar job, um, even with some tech issues, even with, you know, a limited amount of time, the looming threat of a black hat coming in and saying, get off the stage. Everyone did such a wonderful job. So thank you all of you um, for tuning in. And then I think we maybe have one more. Uh, Roger, if you could turn your camera on. Um, we'd love to have you pop on so that we can we can take some Q&A from the audience. Uh, so my job at this point, like I mentioned earlier, is to just pull your questions from the chat and bring them to our experts. Um, we may not be able to get to every question today, and I do apologize in advance if so, um, but we do have two more events coming up. So Tuesday and Thursday of next week, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Mountain Time as well. So keep tuning in. We may be able to answer some of your questions in future presentations. Um, so. I think let's just dive on in. The first question I'm gonna direct toward uh, Mayor Coleman. We have a couple of questions about development in, in urban areas and how that can potentially impact water and energy use. Um, what, what do you think could happen uh, with development? Like as, as cities continue to expand, is there a point where uh, dialing back that growth and, and development of things like subdivisions may be the answer to the water equation or, or what do you think? You know, that's a very politically motivated question because growth in Colorado is one of those things that everybody loves to come here. This is one of the best states in the country to live in. We all know that. That's why we're here. And telling other people they can't come here to live becomes a bit of a challenge. So I think as um, elected representatives and as well as those of us in, in the world of engineering that find creative solutions, instead of limiting growth, we can find ways of accepting the growth, but finding creative ways of how do we use those resources in a way that is much more sustainable in the long run? And that includes water, energy, and all of the above, right? So I, I don't think limiting growth is the right answer because when we limit growth, we limit opportunity. But if we're creative and find good solutions, I think that's a nice balance. Yeah, that's, it's a hard line to walk, right? You know, growth in our state brings so many good things, but it can also bring some challenges. So yes, I, and I recognize that that question put you on the hot seat pretty much right out of the gate. So, um, Patty, just very fast to say, you can read the, any city charter and you will not find the authority or the Denver Water Char Charter that says this entity has the power to set a population limit. I read it over and over, but you won't find that. And so that is really back to the citizens. It's back to land use planning. But it is interesting how people want to put that burden on water when, in fact, the water managers don't have the authority to act on that. So that's just me being, um, I don't know what I am. I'm uh, Jen Coleman's representative and saying, what can she do? That's a fair point too. This next question, I think I'm gonna to direct to Roger first, but then Luke, you may also have something to add to this. Um, Roger, one of the questions that came up that was specifically addressed towards you is, are there incentives for tribes to re retain energy and water resources for tribal use? Or what sort of pressure is there to perhaps sell off water rights um, or other resources to high bidders? Um, so what can you tell us a little bit about some of the financial incentives to sell off um, water rights? Well, I, I think when you go back to it, um, the owners, you know, of those 
resources, be it water or energy resources, both, they're natural resources. Um, and the tribes that own those resources, they have an internal process. And there's a big internal demand with the population growing 4% per year. I know that 4% number doesn't sound like a very big number, but it's a, it's a huge number relative to other race uh, groups. Um, I think we're one of the fastest growing sectors of the U.S. population by race. So that internal demand uh, for the unborn and those coming on for energy and water resources, there's a huge internal demand. So for the tribal leadership to make those decisions, because what you're asking about is the economic uh, uh, um, end of that decision, but there's also the other three forces. When the tribal leader's making decisions, it's, it's usually not really based on simple economics of supply demand. Okay, we have enough water, we have enough energy, we have some excess, let's go sell it. It's really not like that. Um, I think that it's much more complicated and I think it's much more sophisticated, quite honestly, in the sense that when you start thinking about cultural preservation, environmental protection and economic development all at the same time, so that three-legged stool of decision-making, um, you can't boil it down to simple economics and say, well, are there incentives? I, I think there are incentives. And I think there's disincentives. So I think we start thinking about that very complicated intersection of cultural preservation, environmental protection, thinking about the wing, fin, four-legged, um, talking about values, uh, conservation, recreation, you know, all those kinds of things that go into the decision-making about, you know, should we buy or sell uh, these resources? And I think Patty's words of normal, prepared and resilient, you know, I think that the COVID has really caused us to sit and be quiet and to stay safe and sound. And you think about those old words of state, you know, safe and sound. You know, we repeat words, I don't know about you, but I say, oh, safe and sound. Well, what does that mean? That's probably a hundred year old saying from the influenza, the Spanish flu, safe and sound, to be sound. You know, so I think now when we're sound and we start thinking about, uh, we have lots of time now to think about things and contemplate things whereas we didn't before we were moving so fast. I think when we have an opportunity to think about normal, prepared and resilient, I think it's time for us as a collective, as Patty is advocating, and I'm in very interested in hearing more about these kind of collective voices and minds and perspectives to think out loud and between amongst each other, what is normal, what is prepared, what is resilient? And what does that mean from all of our various perspectives? I think there's a lot of institutional wisdom and experience in forums like this and to have the audience or folks that are listening in to contribute into that process. So I think keeping these kinds of forums moving forward in the future is a very good and wise thing and it's going to be better uh, I think at the end of the day. I don't know if I answered your question directly um, but I, I don't think it's a simple issue of trying to answer that question about the economics. It's much more complicated than that. So that's yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say is I don't think it's a simple question to answer. So um, I think that's about as good of a shot as one can have at answering quite a question. Uh, Luke, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Otherwise, we have some more questions coming in that I can pull. Yeah, really briefly. Um, there's just a, an interesting, again, case study. I'm always coming back to stories. Um, there's a really interesting story out of the Colorado River Indian tribes, which um, is a tribal entity that straddles the Colorado or the California Arizona border, and they had an issue where there was a proposal to um, make an agreement with the water authority for the greater Los Angeles area, and it actually became a very hot issue within the tribe of whether or not do we hold on to the water and use it here for agriculture, for municipal use, or do we try and find a way to maybe lease some of the water to the greater LA area? So if anybody's interested, you, could, you can check out some of the coverage of, of that, um, that particular case study, which kind of is a good distillation of that. Do we hold on to it? Do we market it? You know, there's different push and pull from even just within a single tribe. Uh, Luke and Talia, sorry to weigh in here, but, um, or barge in here. Having the, the concept of selling water, uh, a tribe selling water, there's this internal discussion within the tribal uh, community. Uh, it's very offensive for some, and maybe even most tribes, the concept of even selling water as if it's ours to sell. 
um, it's not a commodity that we manufactured and it's to be shared uh, by the wing, the fin, and the four-legged. So I think that those kinds of conversations, I know those deals go on, I know that conversation, I've been part of those conversations, but I just wanted to say that external to that conversation that might be in the public domain, there are conversations that are not in the public domain about even selling water, uh, that, that whole concept of selling water as if I own it. Thank you for bringing that up. I think it's important to acknowledge that some of the language around these conversations that we're having is very colonial. So thank you for, for making that acknowledgement. Um, another one that I want to bring up um, is actually, I think, directed toward Jan again, but Jayla, you might want to weigh in on this. Um, I've seen several questions come in around the potential for things like xeriscaping, the potential for things like, you know, reducing water use in lawns and and things like golf courses, you know, sort of ag not agricultural use. You can't really call that, you can't call that agriculture. You know what I'm talking about though. Um, the use of water in, in keeping these large, large fields of Kentucky bluegrass green. At what point do you think the city of Thornton or other places might need to start offering assistance to other cities, either in directing, here's how you adopt these sorts of policies. And at what point do we maybe need to mandate things like, no, you can't grow Kentucky bluegrass. That was a question that I saw come in. If at a certain point, are we going to have to say, nope, you can't grow that kind of grass anymore? Jan, do you want to go first? <laughs> right, I can go first. So zero scaping for Thornton is relatively new, only because people were so used to the style of Kentucky bluegrass. You build your home, the American dream, build a home, put in a beautiful green yard, water it all the time. It, you know, that's the old model of the American dream. The new dream today is to make sure that we manage conservation and we use our resources respectfully and appropriately. And so we've done a lot of work in Thornton teaching people what that means. And so we have a couple of example gardens, even in city property, where, you know, right by our rec center, we have a beautiful grass area where we play soccer, but everything that is not used for that recreation purpose has been transferred into what we call naturally Thornton. And so we're creating spaces that are more natural to the, an arid climate. So you're not having to constantly water grass in order to have people enjoy the beauty that we have in Colorado. I think from a policy perspective, um, I'm one of those people that tends to hate mandating anything just because I feel like mandates tend to make people react poorly. However, if you set up very positive interactions and you encourage people and you put incentives in place for people to do that, I think you get a much more effective response to it. We even allow um, neighborhoods now that when they come in, bluegrass is not a requirement in, in order to build a new neighborhood. What we want is a very pretty landscape. And if we use the natural resources to do that, all the better. Yeah, that makes sense. And we do have one comment from someone that came in saying that Castle Rock is paying people to take out their turf and replace with their escape. So yeah, an example of incentives there. Jayla, what would you like to add? Yes, yeah, so I think I would just add, I think um, Thornton is doing, from what I understand, a really tremendous job in terms of pushing the needle on their gallons per capita per day. And um, we, we heard a little bit on Tuesday when I did pop into the discussion that you had that day with the, the panel that was assembled that the answer to the West water issues is going to be grass. So whether it's grass for bluegrass in our neighborhoods or grass for cattle or um, grass for public parks and golf courses, um, that's really where um, we can have you know, the, the biggest bang for our buck. And so um, the state does have a requirement now for water providers, for municipal water providers who serve 2000 or more customers or residential taps that they consider in land use mechanisms in their water efficiency plans, which must need, which need to be submitted to the state on a semi-regular basis reporting on, um, you know, the, the impact of those measures and increasing water efficiency. And so I think there are opportunities and, um, there are communities that are really pushing the needle partly out of necessity and Castle Rock is certainly one of them um, because they are reliant on a declining groundwater resource. Um, they have done some very um, advanced things, but there, there are tools out there um, with model ordinances that cities can use and demonstrate to, um, for instance, use things like tap fees um, for, for new development to incentivize smaller lot sizes efficiencies that are built into that development from the start rather than having to go back and ask a residential community member to retrofit their yard or their home. Um, there's, there really is a lot that, that can be done. Um, I think it does take in some cases political will and, and from what I understand Thornton's doing a really great job. 
Thank you for that, Jayla. Uh, one question, I'm not quite sure who to direct this one to because it's maybe a little bit out of the box, but it came up in this session and it came up in the last one too. So I think it might be worth bringing up. What are some really out of the box solutions that we may have to consider um, to solve the West water issues? One, one suggestion that was in this chat um, and came up last time as well is a pipeline from large aquifers el elsewhere in the country Luke shaking his head a little bit, uh, or even I think someone suggested in our last session, um, funneling water in from places like the Great Lakes. You know, what are some really out of the box solutions that could be possible or maybe have been thrown out there and considered, but wouldn't be practical for a number of reasons? I guess I'll leave that one open to the group. I have something, I have something which I think is uh, more affordable and less disruptive, uh, which is to recognize that nearly, well, that many, many religious groups, including, of course, many Indian uh, tribal groups have seen water as sacred. So that I would prefer to a pipeline. Um, and I don't quite know how you organize the religious thinking of many different denominations and so on, but it does seem, I mean, water is life, if I can use that phrase that many Indian people use. And without it, uh, there is, that's a terrible thing. Dehydration is a terrible thing, a, a terrible way for a human being to go. Well, you can take out golf courses and nobody perishes from the lack of the golf course. So water is, is used in all kinds of ways that are not necessarily life-sustaining, but just some bedrock way of reminding people and speaking of food and agricultural production, every time you buy a strawberry, it's an agricultural water transfer from a place that grew it. So, so some way in which we could uh, pray more, I'm not going to say that exactly because I'm at a state university, but the pipeline, maybe not, but the, the deepen the sense of the, well, how could you make it any deeper of what water means to human life and existence? And um, I, I think it, if Roger wanted to come in for a minute or two on that, because that is so much, it's true of whatever race, nationality, or ethnicity, water is the common need that life rests on and why we've delegated certain groups to take it on and the rest of us don't, don't do that. So, I mean, Roger, do you see any hope for white people is really my question here. Uh, can you put your black hat back on, Patty? No, I'm just, kidding. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just teasing you. You know, I, I think when you start thinking about the, the construct that the, the intellectual construct that Patty's talking about is, it really takes it from it takes the the, the economics out of it, and it takes the recreation, uh, you know, and all the things and and using words like normal, prepared, resilient, all those kinds of concepts that we've become so used to. Um, and I think if we could take it out of the tribal ceremony, we can take it out of the, you know, my grandfather, my mother and father's hippie days and the new agers today. Um, and we take it out of places like Boulder and Jackson Hole, Wyoming. You know, I think if we could take it, the, that, that kind of a message to the general public and get it into our schools. I mean, I think we all, we all evolve in all of us. And I think we've all evolved um, in the 70s through the recycle and the don't litter kinds of things, and then you ha you're forced to wear seat belts, and now we're forced to wear masks. You know, I think we can all learn, not white people, all of us, all people, uh, all earth people, we can all learn between amongst each other. Um, and I think it's gonna take time, but it's, but it's never gonna happen unless we start. And I think, Patty, you're asking a question about, um, you know, can we keep these conversations moving and the merit and the value of keeping these kinds of conversations moving is really is to start constructing those kinds of concepts that water is sacred. It's not sacred to us as earth people, as human beings. It's sacred to the wing, the fin, and the four-legged. I mean, it's sacred to the plants. It's sacred to agriculture. Um, so, but I think if we can kind of take it out of the economic uh, and mainstream values, and then all of a sudden when we start to recognize that it's, it's, it is sacred, then we're gonna stop wasting water and start conserving water. And then there may be enough water for a growing population and growing demands and growing societies. Um, I think that that's, but I think we have to start. Um, and I think it starts in forums like this and if we can continue forums like this, I, I think that we have hope. Great, thank you so much. Uh, with about five minutes left in our program time, um, at this point I would like to open it up to all of our panelists if there's any sort of final messaging that you'd like to share, or if you perhaps would like to respond to or echo or piggyback, uh, something that a fellow panelist has shared, um, now is the time when I'd like to open the floor. So I think I'll, I'll let anyone jump at the chance. Just nudge a little bit in the direction of joining the water and energy issues, and if you choose to do that in your last 
comments because we did end up separating them a little bit in this event and in Tuesdays as well. Yeah. And part of the point of this is is melding them. So okay. yeah, or emulsifying as Luke emulsifying said. Emulsifying is the word, and it does refer to salad dressing. And as all things should. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So somehow or other, I just think about salad dressing. Think about putting these these two things together for how do we think of them at the same time if we are going to ask consumers to be alert and aware of what they are doing as users, can we have them think about water and energy in the same moment or do they have to have separate moments of contemplation of their, of their dependence on those two things? How do, if you, if you choose to, but if you would like to bring those two topics together, that would be cool. And if you would like to just respond to something somebody else said, that's fine too. So I can jump in, I'm used to being the one that jumps in first in the political world. So I think when it comes to water and energy, it's so, complicated. And while I agree with Roger's point on water is sacred, I think at the same time, it also has driven our economic value as a state. And so to separate them now, I think is really hard for people to do. So in order to talk about it in a way that makes the most sense from the energy side is that you talk about how do you, how can you take the values from the seventies that we learned around reuse, recycle and translate them into 2020. That makes a lot of sense. And something we didn't really talk about was my day job. So mayor is a part-time job, for those of you who don't know. And as large as Thornton is, it unfortunately doesn't pay for a full-time role. And it, we have a city manager that runs the day-to-day. -day. And so I do have a day job where I'm the director of facilities, engineering, and construction for Whiting Petroleum, which is an oil and gas company, mostly out of North Dakota. And water in oil and gas, in order to create energy, is critical. And one of the things that we have learned over the years is when we use that water and how we use that water is just as important as the oil and gas that comes out of the ground. And so we found ways to recycle that water to be able to reuse it because it can't be used for anything else once we use it for that, so that reason. And so it's really important to take advantage of that technology and that engineering piece to get creative in how we reuse water. And I think that translates well into municipal use as well because we're figuring out ways to recycle and reuse water efficiently within the municipality. And so I love the blending of the two areas. You know, my, my brain loves the political side of things, but it really thrives on the engineering side of things. So finding that blend of the world, I think is gonna be how we get through to the future. All right, anyone else? I would, I would just jump in to say that, and I touched on this a little bit in my remarks, but there really is a sense of urgency around these, both of these issues, water and energy, um, particularly in the West because water is so existential. It touches every aspect of our society, of our economies. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of this is going to fall on our political leaders in order to have answers to some of these questions. And, at the same time, the earth is kind of moving under our feet and these um, notions that we have about how the past can inform our future decision making, it, it, it doesn't connect because the, the climate change is upending everything. And so um, really, I think talking to people who think about these issues a lot, there is really a kind of a sense of urgency um, around these issues and, and figuring this out because uh, literally our lives depend on it. I would just build on what Luke said about that sense of urgency and think about the experience that we've just all been through with COVID-19 and thinking back to the early days when you had these interruptions where you couldn't get toilet paper and everyone was freaking out or um, you know you, you were limited to the amount of meat that you could purchase of any one type at the grocery store and I think going back to Commissioner Greenberg's comments that um, you know this really started to heighten the awareness that people who are so far removed from the source of their food of their energy um, I think that's just a really important connection that we think about making um, just as we have these urbanized communities I think about our youth and what exposure do the kids living here in Denver where I live, you know, not everyone gets to go out and experience our rivers and not everyone is out, you know, visiting a farmer and really getting to build those deep connections with the, the roots of, of what this resource really means and allows us to do. 
And um, and then I think from on the urban lens, um, you know, the, the fact that we do rely on recreation in those urban parks, I think that's something that, you know, for um, as much as the, the finger can be pointed at the front range for, for water transfers and water development and water use, um, I do think it's critical that we get as efficient as possible with water use without sacrificing some investment of applying that water toward a quality of life in our urban parks because that's where um, many of our citizens, that's that's maybe their only exposure to a place to recreate in a somewhat natural environment. So just a little bit of food for thought or how, how do we make those connections for people who are increasingly removed from um, these resources. Thanks, Jayla. Uh, we are a little bit over time, but um, if Roger and Patty have words to bring us home, the microphone is being passed to you. So, Roger, how about you? Yeah, I certainly would not want to be the last one, and I really respect and appreciate Patty's experience and wisdom on that. So, um, I would just kind of continue to echo uh, the continued discussion, the forums. I've learned a lot um, from the other panelists. I've learned a lot about um, water and energy, and even uh, I've learned about myself um, and uh, some of the things that I, I can work on in terms of being better and doing better. Um, so I would just advocate the continued discussion uh, and to keep these kinds of forums moving forward. Yeah, agreed. It's important to keep these conversations going. Patty, any final words? I'd like to uh, think about Ian Forster and his Remarkable. Uh, it's a very depressing book, so we won't spend time on that. But his his phrase "only connect" the phrase in a, a central place in Ian Forster's novels and maybe in all of his work. So "only connect" is the phrase that has just been, and I will say that is a tragic novel. But let's let that go for, for now and just go with the positive meanings of "only connect." And I would like to say that one of the chat people it really struck me that Oreo Hart has a dad who worked at Denver Water at Gross Dam uh, in the construction of Gross Dam and then as a caretaker at Gross Dam uh, and then another one of the things. So just that sense of time and connection and it's very shallow time compared to Indian people's sense and that's why it's always so much better when we can have that perspective in our conversations. But just that time, I was very struck when I saw uh, that Oriel Hart's father worked at Gross Reservoir and the construction of Gross Dam. That wasn't reservoir, it was just a dam. And that some, pe some people died in an explosion there. That was, there was a very tragic event during the construction and happily uh, Mr. Hart wasn't in that. But there's every time in Denver when someone takes a drink of water, there is a tribute to the enormous human energy that went into the building of, of Gross Dam and the mortality that came with that as well. So there's a real sober up. Uh, when you turn on the faucet, when you go to the thermostat, somebody, well, someone might have died for that to happen, but people lived and died providing that. And so just that sense of how much each of those technological infrastructure things really connects us to the people who were once as alive as we are. Uh, and asks us to think about the people of the future who will be as, li as alive as we are and who we would like to th have think well of us, right? Huh? That's the plan is to have posterity say, oh, those ancestors, they were, they were cool, maybe. That, that seems like a good place to leave things for the day, but thank you for bringing that home, Patty. All right, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. It was wonderful to have your comments and your questions. A big thanks again to all of our panelists for bringing their expertise and their unique and diverse perspectives to the conversation. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be posted on the museum's YouTube and Vimeo channels, excuse me, sometime within the next week. So keep your eyes there if you want to go back to these conversations and, and dive a little bit deeper. Um, and we'll see you again next week on Tuesday and Thursday. So same time, same link, 1030 to, or no, excuse me, 10 o'clock to 1130 Mountain time on Tuesday and Thursday to keep the conversation rolling. Thanks so much for being here, folks. We, we really appreciate it. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.